What you're looking at is an 8 foot tall, 30,000 foot long privacy fence, sorry, dust fence, being installed around the destroyed remains of Lahaina, what was once the capital city of the Kingdom of Hawaii, now nothing more than an ash heap. This fence is supposedly being put up to protect the residents of Maui, the ones that weren't burned alive last month, from hazardous waste in the form of harmful dust and particulates that could be kicked up into the air during the cleanup operation. Interesting that none of the workers who would be directly exposed to these harmful dusts are wearing masks. Hmm. Anyways, as you can see from the thumbnail and or title of this video, many people believe that the truth about what happened in Lahaina is being covered up. And if I'm being honest, I think the official story is dubious at best. And now, with low-level government employees being hung out to dry by their superiors, quietly resigning to avoid scrutiny, and a new emergency proclamation prohibiting not only filming the burn sites, but even threatening arrest for stopping anywhere near Lahaina, now labeled as an exclusion zone or ground zero, people are starting to ask one very important question. Why? So in this video, I'll be covering all the facts, sketchy behavior, and comments made by local authorities. And of course, all the conspiracy theories I can find regarding the swift destruction of Lahaina in Maui, and the cover-up that is supposedly currently ongoing. Just a quick disclaimer, just because I cover something doesn't necessarily mean I endorse or believe it. I'm just going to present what I can find with the utmost respect for the dead and the survivors. At this point, we know at least 114 Lahaina residents passed away in this tragedy, many of them children, which is why I'm covering it. Something about this whole thing is extremely fishy. Actually, there's quite a few strange decisions made by authorities and coincidences here. And if there are responsible parties out there wreaking havoc on innocent people, I think it's worth looking into. I'm Max Powers. This is Parasite TV. Let's get into it. In the early hours of August 8, 2023, approximately 3.45 a.m., Maui officials announced in a news release that a brush fire was reported in the Olinda Road area of Kula in central Maui. At 6.37 a.m., officials claimed that winds fueled by Hurricane Dora, which is about 490 miles off the coast of Maui at the time, helped create conditions for a three-acre brush fire that breaks out in the area of Lahaina Luna Road, east of the historic seaside town of Lahaina. At 9 a.m., Maui officials declared the brush fires are 100% contained and are no cause for alarm. At 11 a.m., a couple in their 70s, Gail and Ross Hart, see the fire cross a gulch near their neighborhood in Kula. The Harts and their neighbors are holding the flames back themselves with garden hoses when the water is suddenly cut off and they are forced to leave. The blaze intensifies and consumes the neighborhood. The only thing standing is our mailbox, Gail later said. At 3 p.m., Lahaina residents begin to hear repeated booming noises, assuming they're explosions caused by the fires in the nearby area. 30 minutes later, Lahaina is completely engulfed in flames. 13 minutes after that, Acting Governor Sylvia Luke issues an emergency proclamation, urging evacuation. Lieutenant Governor Luke is serving in Governor Josh Green's stead as he is conveniently out of state. Residents try to either rush home to gather their families or rush away from the area to escape the flames. For the most part, neither are successful due to roadblocks, both set up by police and by utility vehicles, completely blocking the paths out of the doomed area. At 5.38 p.m., smoke surrounds boats at Lahaina Mooring Field. People are trapped. Boats, cars, and gas stations are exploding. Everything is burning. 5.41 p.m., a Lahaina retail area is swallowed up by thick black smoke and flame. The roads never open, and as the flames grow closer and the heat intensifies, people begin fleeing into the ocean. By 7 p.m., most of Lahaina is rubble as flames ravage the Lahaina Harbor and explosions are heard every few seconds amid the rush of fierce winds. Lahaina resident Brian Sizemore sees at least a dozen bodies floating in the water. 3.30 p.m. the next day, 24 hours after Lahaina was set aflame, Maui officials confirmed that a quote, federal team had arrived on the island to assist with search and rescue. Surviving residents begin discovering the aftermath of the violent destruction, finding streams of liquefied metal dripping away from cars, some of which contained the ashen remains of entire families within. Saturday, August 12th, authorities confirm all fires are 100% contained, the death toll is unknown, and hundreds are missing, presumed to be under the rubble of the destroyed city. Monday, August 14th, police confirm 99 fatalities, with only about 25% of the affected area being searched. In a matter of hours, a beautiful seaside community resting on long-coveted coastal land, the ancient capital city of the Kingdom of Hawaii, 
has been reduced to rubble and white ash. The community, desperately in need of shelter, supplies, and answers, struggles to survive, while the rest of us watch in horror and begin to wonder how this could have happened. In the immediate aftermath of the fire, the roads into the affected areas remain blocked, preventing volunteers and organizations from entering to provide aid, supplies, and food to the survivors, and preventing many people that were seeking shelter outside the area from leaving, leaving it up to an organized, determined few to bring in supplies by boat, jet ski, and plane, all while having to avoid authorities, who on more than one occasion attempt to intercept supplies and prevent volunteers from entering the area. Just a few days after the fires were put out, the rubble still smoldering, the governor of Hawaii, Josh Green, announced in a press conference that he was exploring options for the state to take over ownership of the land in order to build workforce housing or a memorial and sending those displaced by the fires to live elsewhere. I'm already thinking about ways for the state to acquire that land so that we can put it into workforce housing, to put it back into families, or to make it open spaces in perpetuity as a memorial to people who were lost. Practically telling the community that had just lost everything they owned, that they would also indeed be losing their land. Before all of the families whose children are still missing bury their family members, before the authorities can even answer what the death toll is, and before any government official has made any real attempt to help the community, they are holding meetings with developers to talk about the possibility possibility of waiving restrictions and speeding up the permit process so that the county can begin construction on whatever projects they see fit without consulting the people whose land was just raised by hellfire. What happens when there is a major disaster and loss of life, and officials not only fail to communicate, but even worse, try to stifle any communication about what's happened, is people are left to wonder and investigate themselves, leaving us with many of the questions we'll be going over today. Before we get to any theories, I think we should talk about a few things that aren't theories, but facts, backed up by witness testimony, official admittance, and superficial media coverage in a segment I call Roadblocks, Sirens, and Water. First, the roadblocks. According to multiple eyewitness survivors, in the midst of the chaos, as the fires ravaged the area around Lahaina and grew closer and closer, residents began trying to evacuate, most of them trying to use the main paved road out of town. Highway 30. But Highway 30 was blocked by a police barricade, and the residents were guided back into town and corralled down onto Front Street, being told that's where they'd evacuate from. Well, this is Front Street now. Very few of the people that were ushered into Front Street to evacuate were actually able to do so because of various police roadblocks, downed trees, downed power lines, and roads blocked by utility vehicles. The people that made it out did so by driving up onto the sidewalk, through yards, around police barricades, and on dirt roads to get up over the fires. Listen to these eyewitness accounts of what happened. I was in my truck going to check on some uh, customers' properties, and all of a sudden all the roads were being blocked off right in front of me and I'd, from the cops, and I would go to the next street and that would be blocked off, and the next one, and they just blocked everything off, forced everybody down on Front Street, in which then the flames were coming over our vehicles, not on our vehicles, but the flames are coming over top of our vehicles. What, what street do you want at this point in time? Front Street. You're on Front Street yes. itself? Yep. So you got directed onto Front Street? Yep. Where did you start when you started this journey? I was going down the highway and they blocked it off and wouldn't let me go any further. So you were coming from La Neopoco? No, I was coming from uh, Waikuli. Why? Okay, so you're heading going down the you're highway. You're heading south. And then they, they, stopped, they stopped us from going up on the bypass. Then they wouldn't let me go past the bypass to the other exits to go up there. Um, then, so you couldn't go up the bypass? No. And then, and then all of a sudden they said, everybody's off, get off this highway, go down this way, down into town. Then they started blocking everything off there. And then you were down on Front Street. And I got all the way down to Safeway. And so you got corralled onto yes, Front Street. You yes. started on Honopilani Highway. Yes. And you ended up on Front Street. Yes. Couldn't go anywhere. They just said, go north, go north, go north. And then when we got on Front Street, embers were coming over the buildings and landing on our vehicles. And we're all in a line trying to get to the end of Front Street to go north, like they told us to, not knowing that the police blocked off the end of Front Street so nobody could move. And then everybody panicked, and they all started driving. Everybody went up on the sidewalks and through yards, took out the other lane. Nobody, and then all of a sudden, nobody could move anywhere. So all I did was try to inch my way over to another yard and drive up through a, a a sidewalk come back around and then I went 
the cops were moving around one exit, so I ended up getting up on the highway, even though they tried to direct me another way, and then I hightailed it to home. All the way from the Safeway to the chart house, not one car had moved. And I was wondering what was stopping the traffic. Well, it was a policeman. And I got to the end and I looked up north, there were no obstructions, there was no reason to keep those cars there. Are you serious? I'm serious as a heart attack. And I, I said, what are you doing? He goes, well, I'm under orders to keep them here. And I said, the fire is, is right around Safeway. It's going to hit Front Street. You know, these people got to get out of here. And he said, I'm following orders. No way. And I, so I just kept walking. I, well, maybe he knows something I don't. When he was later heading home through Lahaina Town just before 3 p.m., he hit this roadblock on the southbound highway at Kapuna Kea before the Cannery Mall. Herzog backtracked to where Front Street meets the highway. At 319, his camera shows a police vehicle blocking access to the highway at Papalaua. At 426, Herzog abandoned his car at Kingdom Hall and walked to Mala Wharf. The highway was completely shut down for two and a half hours at Keave Street until at least 524 p.m. Traffic routed towards Front Street. At 5.30, Herzog comes to the end of Front Street and to his surprise... It looks like two police vehicles parked kind of nose to that exit for Front Street kind of at a V like this. The traffic had basically bottlenecked right there. So there were cars in both lanes trying to go north by this point, but everyone was stopped on Front Street right there. Some of the roads weren't blocked by police, but by utility vehicles, supposedly repairing downed power lines. In a vacuum, this makes sense. It would be a terribly unfortunate series of events. Hurricane force winds downing power lines in one area while fanning the flames of a dangerous brush fire in another. It could happen and it almost certainly did, but that has nothing to do with Highway 30, the default route of escape out of the area to the north and south, a route that witness after witness after witness has now claimed was blocked by police vehicles and cones. With many people claiming the officers were directing traffic away from the highway, ordering vehicles to turn around. Just following orders, I'm sure. Those that disobeyed survived. Another frightening lapse in disaster response that more than likely multiplied the death toll is the fact that not one siren went off for the entirety of the disaster. Hawaii boasts what the state describes as the largest integrated outdoor all-hazard public safety warning system in the world, with about 400 sirens positioned across the island chain to alert people to various natural disasters and other threats. 80 of those sirens are on Maui, and like I said, none of them were activated to alert citizens of the incoming fires. The the reason? I'll let Maui's own emergency response manager, Herman Andaya, tell you himself. Do you regret your decision and have you considered handing over the reins to somebody with more experience? To say that I'm not, not qualified I think is incorrect. I uh, went through a, a very arduous process uh, and I was vetted, I had to take a civil service exam, I was uh, interviewed by seasoned emergency managers, and they all deemed me qualified. In fact, I was selected. Do you regret not sounding the sirens? I do not. And the reason why... So many people said they could have been saved if they had time to escape. Had a siren gone off, they would have known that there was a crisis emerging. And as we know, so many bodies were found in the ground as the flames caught their heels. Do you want to give me the answer? The sirens, as I had mentioned earlier, is used primarily for tsunamis. And that's the reason why many of them are found, almost all of them are found on the coastline. The public is trained to seek higher ground in the event that the siren is sounded. Had we sounded the siren that night, we we're afraid that people would have gone Malka. And if that was the case, then they would have gone into the fire. According to Herman himself, he had zero experience in the emergency management field when he was hired. And CBS News correspondent Jonathan Vigliotti actually did an incredible job pushing back on the Maui authorities during a press conference. So, not only were there no alarms sounded, but Andaya vehemently defended his choice to not alert the people of Maui based on the lie that these sirens are only for tsunamis. A quick aside, that man who sort of angrily interrupted is Maui Mayor Richard Bisson, and I think the tone kind of reveals a lot about how any real journalist who asks tough questions have been treated by Maui and federal officials, but more on that later. So. 
According to Maui officials, they intentionally chose not to set off sirens because they believed that this would cause panic and raise the death toll even higher. Reason being that the sirens are only used to alert people about tsunamis, to which the proper protocol would be to go inland and seek higher ground. And in this case, that's where the fire was coming from. The only issue is, this is patently untrue. Hawaii's own emergency management website details fast facts about the system which they call the All Hazard Statewide Warning Siren System. Emphasis on all hazard there. In my opinion, the most pertinent fast fact detailed on the site is this one. The All Hazard Siren System can be used for a variety of both natural and human-caused events, including tsunamis, hurricanes, dam breaches, flooding, wildfires, volcanic eruptions, terrorist threats, hazardous material incidents, and more. The siren system was designed for and has been used in several different scenarios, including fires. Several residents have claimed that the sirens would have alerted them, giving them at least a precious few moments to evacuate before they were completely surrounded by the fire. As we covered in the timeline, Ross Hart was one of the many locals fighting the fires on their own, until suddenly, the water was seemingly cut off. Well, that was no accident. A state official, allegedly a specific official named Kaleo Manuel, refused to release water to fight the fires until it was much too late. I've seen some reports that the fire department didn't respond, but that's not true. The fire department was doing what they could, but they drained their water reservoirs while doing their duty. More water was available, but it was up to the Hawaii Commission on Water Resource Management to approve its use. As the fire department desperately called for more water to be diverted from local streams into their reservoirs, the CRWM denied the request and instead told the firefighters to check with the local farmer to see how a diversion of the water supply would affect him. They eventually did approve the diversion of water five hours later, after Lahaina had already been reduced to a smoldering ash heap. Here is Kaleo Manuel, the official who could have acted and saved lives in a resurfaced video. The commission is responsible per, per our authorizing statute to protect and manage all water resources in the state. One water is like taking it and looking at it from a holistic system perspective, and that's not if any different than how Hawaiians traditionally manage water. You know, in, in essence, we treated it, and Native Hawaiians treated water as one of the earthly manifestations of a god and a kua kane. And so that reverence um, for a resource and that reciprocity in relationship was, was something that was really, really important to our worldview and, and well-being, right? And living in an island in isolated from other, you know, civilizations. Um, if it seems like his response is him saying a lot without really saying anything, you are correct. On a secluded chain of islands, fresh water should be revered, but not while your people burn to death by the hundreds. Manuel has declined interviews and was reassigned to a different position one week after the fires, but is now apparently suing for his position back. Roadblocks set up by police, blocking the highways and front street, hurting thousands of people onto one street, directly in the path of a massive, fast-moving wall of fire. Water, denied to those brave few who stayed behind to fight the fires. Sirens, the most basic level of protection, intentionally left left silent. Without any conspiracy theories whatsoever, the facts and witness testimony seem to shed light on a horrifying possibility. Were these fires allowed to destroy Lahaina, burning untold numbers of innocent civilians to ash? With just these details, the public faith in their local government should be completely shaken. Some will call it gross negligence, but many others, including local survivors of the fires, feel as though certain aspects of the disaster were intentional. The day of the fire, teenager Kahiro Fuentes was at home with his pet dog in Lahaina while his adoptive parents were at work miles away. His parents told CBS News how their son was enjoying his last days of summer vacation leading up to his 15th birthday. As soon as they heard about the fire, they tried to rush back home but got stuck in traffic. Finally, when they reached home, they were allegedly stopped by police barricades. While their house had burned to the ground, first responders reportedly told them that the area was clear and no one was inside. Two days later, when they were finally allowed to go back home, they discovered their son still holding the family dog, both dead. There are hundreds of families with stories similar to this, except without closure. As horrifying as losing a child is, not knowing what happened to them is equally, if not more so, painful.
painful. See, the elementary and middle schools in Lahaina hadn't started yet, and the high school had sent students home early the morning of the fires due to the high wind advisory. This left many of the children at home, with their unassuming parents away at work. With all of the traffic congestion caused by downed trees, power lines, and roadblocks, many parents and caretakers were unable to make it back home before their houses were burnt down. As of now, a month later, the official death toll sits between 97 and 115. But something is very strange about this number, and it has something to do with the children of Lahaina. The Hawaii State Department of Education issued a report Thursday, August 24th, stating that 2,025 students are not accounted in the Lahaina public school system. The four schools, two elementary, one intermediary, and one high school that comprise the Lahaina School District had a total of 3,001 students enrolled before the fire. The schools are now closed due to damage from the fires. The report states that as as of August 21st, out of the 3,001 students enrolled on August 8th, only 538 had re-enrolled in other public schools, with 438 having enrolled in the state distance learning program, leaving 2,025 students unaccounted for. The report does not mention whether or not any of the missing children were killed in the fire. Now, I don't believe that means that all 2,025 of these children are gone. I think there's at least a few hundred or so that are probably with family, trying to survive through the chaos of losing their homes and entire community with little to no help from the government, and aren't stable enough to send their kids to school yet. But 2,000 out of 3,000 is a lot of missing kids, and the local officials have reacted to questions about these children in a bit of a suspicious manner. I don't know. I was yes, you do. How many children are missing? You I know. I knew the answer to that. I'd be happy to answer that. You have no estimate right, as to how so many children are missing? I guess Nothing? we can end this right now. If you guys want. Sorry. This is one of the biggest takes, questions that the takes, people of Lahaina have, but you know what takes, I answer. It please. always takes please. one or two please. to ruin it for everybody. Please, this That's is our happens. first time. Right. Well, well, we can say that about you. You've sure. ruined it for you're everybody. You're welcome to say it. You're the media. You can say whatever you want. You're a disaster. All right. Okay. Please. You've been the worst mayor we could possibly imagine. Wait. Respect? Uh, respect turn. what? This is the most dismal response we've Please. ever had. You won't wait for your turn. You, you want to shout over these guys that are legitimate. Why don't you give them the real answers then? So. Give are them you? the real answers. That's not oh, his question. Okay. Let him, let him. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. You can go. You can go. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So that was the mayor of Lahaina, Richard Bisson, the same man that lashed out at journalist Jonathan Vigliotti when he was questioning Herman and Daya. After a large-scale disaster, as a public official facing simple questions, such as, how many children are missing, or how many of the dead are children, you either know the answer or you don't. Whatever the case, you do your job as an elected official and deliver the answer with tact. For example, as of right now, our focus being on search and rescue and supplying our surviving community members with the goods and shelter they so desperately need. Unfortunately, I do not know how many children are missing. However, I will continue to be transparent and get back to you as soon as I obtain further insight from our first responders. As I know, this issue is of the utmost importance. Or, this has been an incredible tragedy. The loss of life is staggering probably in the hundreds. Many of those are possibly children. In light of those facts, we are doing everything we can to carefully recover remains from the rubble and meeting with families to either notify them of the passing of their loved ones or reunite them with those that have been rescued. As the mayor, it's not your job to know every detail. Mayor Bisson isn't expected to know. He's expected not to lie not to hide. In fact, as far as optics are concerned, he handled these questions in perhaps the worst possible way. In neither of my two hypothetical responses did I provide any exact details. What I did offer was a sense of responsibility, reverence for the victims of the tragedy and their loved ones, and assurances that once more detailed, acute information was available, it would be shared with the public. In a word, I express basic care for the situation. Mayor Bisson's response is damning. It's a small thing, with massive implications on what is more than likely going on behind the curtain. In my opinion, this reaction screams silent guilt and intentional obfuscation. I'm guessing that's an opinion these actual journalists shared, as after the mayor abandons his own press conference, it seems a couple of the journalists, unsatisfied with the lack of care or any real answers from the mayor, elected to follow him and continue with their line of inquiry, an act that ended with one of them being put in a headlock by local sheriff's deputies, before being shoved around and unlawfully 
detained. I have no love for any of the major news networks, but it is a very, very bad sign when journalists are assaulted or detained or restricted from questioning our elected officials in any capacity. Just following orders again, I presume. Always worked out great in the past, right? As I said, the official death toll still sits between 97 and 115, but this is nearly six weeks after the fire. This is the same number they had when they had only searched 25% of the area. At two weeks after the fire, the government announced 99 fatalities, and anywhere from 850 to 1100 people of all ages missing. How has that number not changed? If we have the remains of 99 people, and know that between 850 and 1100 people are missing, then we process the scene for three or four more weeks. Some of those missing people turn into confirmed as deceased people, with some kind of remains being found. With the questions of how many children are missing, why the death toll is seemingly so far off, the mayor's inability and or reluctance to answer simple questions about the children, and why the area has now been cordoned off, preventing families from recovering their loved ones remaining unanswered, many are now starting to believe that the true nature of the event is being covered up. Now, we take a turn, a turn away from facts and speculation, and immediately after turning, we trip on our own shoelaces and fall into a rabbit hole, a conspiracy rabbit hole, of theories. Many theorists have been quick to point out a strange and kind of disturbing coincidence, that the police chief in Lahaina currently, John Pelletier, used to be a captain with the Las Vegas Police Department, where he acted as the incident commander and led the crisis response to the Las Vegas massacre in October of 2017. Now, I'm not so sure this is anything like a a crazy connection at first glance? A coincidence, definitely. So why do people think this is such an important detail? Well, let's take a brief look. Nothing about John Pelletier's life or career is exceptionally remarkable when looked at through a discerning conspiratorial lens. He was born in Buffalo, New York, and moved around the country before settling in Las Vegas at the age of 17. Before moving to Maui, Pelletier was with the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department for 22 years, where he rose to the ranks and became captain. The third generation police officer had also been the commander of the major violator slash narcotics bureau since 2020. He has a bachelor's degree in political science from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and also earned a certificate from the FBI Academy, which I agree is interesting, but as far as I can tell, he was never an agent. I think the coincidence is more interesting in a meta sense, or what we can kind of infer based on his presence. On October 1st, 2017, the deadliest mass shooting in history took place in Las Vegas, when 64-year-old Stephen Paddock opened fire on the Route 91 music festival during Jason Aldean's set. John Pelletier was the incident commander, and it remains a horrifying, complex event of which the public knows frighteningly little. A flimsy facsimile of a narrative was rolled out in the days following the event, but quickly fell apart. There were very legitimate concerns and witness statements about multiple shooters, Saudi royalty, arms deals gone bad, mysterious unregistered helicopters with no transponders, and thousands of hours of surveillance video that almost instantaneously disappeared, and many, many other questions, all of which have gone completely unanswered, complete with eight survivors and eyewitnesses that happen to be claiming things that went against the narrative, and the attorney representing the music festival and Jason Aldean, all dying within a month of the event. But this isn't a video about the Las Vegas massacre. This video is about a wildfire. So what's my point? Well, if you've made it to this point of the video without leaving a disparaging comment about tinfoil hats, you probably have several questions about said wildfire and the confusing lackluster response from authorities. I think that in the big picture, knowing that we never got answers from a major event, and then knowing that a key figure who held some authority in response to that scenario is now at a higher station with more authority and is involved in another major event with a much larger loss of life, begins to infer to certain people that we will indeed never be getting answers about this event. As the smoke began to clear in Lahaina, Stu Peters posted this picture to X with no caption, inferring that the fires had been started by a directed energy weapon. As soon as he posted it, the masses began rolling their eyes at crazed conspiracy theorists once again. As it was very quickly pointed out, this was an edited version of a time-lapse photo of a Falcon 9 launch in Florida, which is unfortunate because it's these kind of posts that make people believe that directed energy weapons, or DEWs, don't exist. And they 
they definitely do and they have in some form or another for a very very long time for real it's not a secret i literally don't know how to make it any clearer than the government's own site airforceresearchlab.com and i'll just read it right off the site the afrl directed energy directorate operates two major telescope sites that are used to advance ssa technologies one of these sites is located on kirkland air force base new mexico and the other site is located on maui hawaii the maui site is called the air force maui optical and supercomputing or amos site the amos site consists of two facilities that conduct sda operations and research and development the first facility is the maui space surveillance system and the second is the maui high performance computing center research thrusts at the amos site include satellite detection and identification atmospheric compensation and resolved imaging astrodynamics and orbital metrics sensor development and laser propagation through the earth's atmosphere the u.s government and ostensibly other governments have been experimenting with this technology for decades with the potential to revolutionize modern warfare these directed energy systems offer unprecedented speed precision and versatility in engaging and neutralizing various threats the air force research laboratory conducted a test at the white sands test range in new mexico successfully shooting down multiple air-launched missiles in flight using a fiber optic laser. If airborne lasers prove to be as viable and effective as anticipated, future laser weapons could have a profound impact on aerial warfare. Lasers have the potential to serve as extremely fast and precise air-to-air -air and air-to-ground weapons, offering virtually unlimited ammunition capacity. This transformation would revolutionize the capabilities of aircraft, providing them with a versatile and adaptable tool to engage targets with unmatched speed and accuracy. The Air Force Research Laboratory also issued a notice for a six-month study called Compact High Energy Laser Subsystem Engineering Assessment, Chelsea, to identify most promising technology options to scale laser power by next year. The more powerful Chelsea laser may eventually replace self-protect high-energy laser demonstrator and would be more suitable for offensive applications. The Air Force desires an internal or conformal laser mount for its upcoming sixth-generation fighters, which would hug the airframe without compromising their aerodynamic and radar stealth characteristics. Almost 20 years ago, we had the Boeing YAL-1, which was an airborne laser testbed weapon system, a megawatt-class chemical oxygen iodine laser mounted inside a modified military Boeing 747-400F. It was primarily designed as a missile defense system to destroy tactical ballistic missiles. The aircraft was designated YAL-1 in 2004 by the U.S. Department of Defense. The YAL-1 with a low-power laser was test-fired in flight at an airborne target in 2007. A high-energy laser was used to intercept a test target in January 2010, and the following month successfully destroyed two test missiles. That is one example out of dozens of research and development projects that are being deployed today. But just because DEWs exist doesn't mean they were used on Maui. So what is causing people to claim that they must have been? Well, it's probably a combination of several different things. During this segment, please keep in mind that a wildfire with plenty of dry fuel and oxygen burns at about 1,000 472 degrees Fahrenheit. First of all, you may have seen videos showing aluminum that had liquefied and began streaming away from the cars that were being melted down into pools of liquid metal. Well, one of the reasons people believe this is so strange is that aluminum melts at 1,220 degrees Fahrenheit, but asphalt's melting point is about 340 degrees, and none of the asphalt is melted or deformed in any way. Now, that by itself wouldn't convince me, as there's no fuel source on the asphalt that would cause it to burn for an extended period of time. But in a car fire, the gas tank will explode and the car will burn. But you never see this, streams of liquid aluminum running away from the car. Another reason is that John Pelletier, the police chief, has confirmed that all deceased persons that are being recovered are John or Jane Doe's because the remains are nothing more than ash heaps, sometimes with bits of bone. When we find these, you know, our family and our friends, the remains we're finding is through a fire that melted metal. We have to do rapid DNA to identify them. Every one of these 89 are John and Jane Doe's. So when we pick up the remains and they fall apart, and so when you have 200 people running through the scene yesterday, and some of you, that's what you're stepping on. 
I don't know how much more you want me to describe it. The issue with that is described in this video by a former funeral home owner. So as a former funeral home owner and licensed funeral director for over two decades, I worked very extensively and closely with our local crematory. I was taught by that crematory that they need to cremate in between 2,000 and 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So the question is, how hot were those fires to be able to incinerate or cremate human remains? We know that it was at a higher level than 1,500 to 2,500 because it melted the rims on the vehicles. Why are there no bodies in the cars? In which he describes that he was taught that when cremating a human body, the temperature needed to be between 2,000 and 3,000 degrees in order to effectively and completely incinerate the remains. A quick Google search shows that even at these temperatures in a closed, controlled environment designed to turn a body to ash, the process still takes two to three hours. Although the brush fire that led to the fire in Lahaina started at roughly 6 a.m. and the final fires weren't contained into until the next day. No one structure burned for that long at that high of a temperature. Most people that die in a house fire or in a forest fire leave a body behind. Again, you can Google it. Most fire deaths are not caused by burns, but by smoke inhalation. Often, smoke incapacitates so quickly that people are overcome and can't make it to an otherwise accessible exit. All of the people that passed away in their cars waiting at the roadblocks, all of the people that passed away at home unaware that either there was a fire or unaware of how close it was, there are no bodies. There's only ash. The point being that whatever caused these fires was anomalously hotter than a wildfire or something else was melting things during the fire. Then there's the blue theory. <laughs> There was something blue that they didn't want to burn. Jeff Cygnus, who gathered an incredible amount of footage on the ground after the fires, made a fascinating video that I'll let play here. Okay, guys, this is the last episode I'm going to do for a while, but it should be a pretty good one. It's things that did not burn during the fire. I went through hours of footage, and it was pretty interesting what I found. Here are the famous umbrellas. These are actually Tommy Bahama umbrellas, and... I have pictures of these before the fire, so you can see what they actually used to look like. Not very different now. And then the sole surviving car on Front Street in front of the outlet mall. And I actually found another sole survivor car the other direction that's a little bit further south on Front Street, which I didn't notice at the time. But here it is right here. You can see it on the left in this frame here. The theory being that whatever DEW technology has allegedly been deployed operates on a certain frequency, and that frequency has no effect on certain shades of the color blue, somehow. I'm going to be honest, I don't understand it, I'm not a scientist, but it is very strange. When a wildfire blows through a town, there will inevitably be items that survive untouched, but it becomes a little strange when they're all without fail the same color, nearly the same shade of blue. Blue. Some of the footage I've shown earlier in the video, including some of the testimony about roadblocks, was gathered by Eric West and posted to his YouTube channel, Hawaii Real Estate. As you could probably guess, before the fire, his page was dedicated to real estate opportunities in Hawaii. Since, he has completely dedicated himself and his channel to interviewing survivors of the disaster, getting their stories out there, and investigating the strange circumstances surrounding the fire, and has raised nearly a million dollars for survivors. Eric doesn't focus on conspiracies or anything like that. He just points out what's been going on. Like Jeff Cygnus, he's also explored around and pointed out very strange burn sites where cars have basically been liquefied, even when nowhere near any of the fires. But most interesting to me was a couple weeks back. He stood on the highway outside of Lahaina to get some footage of Lahaina from a distance, and this is what occurred. Just so I get it for the record, people are asking why we can't park and look at these images and take pictures. I just need to know what the law is that says we can't do it. What law? I, proclamation, you cannot park or walk on a bypass. Thank you. you. What, you what, what law do I reference? What law, what law do I reference? Do I know you need what? To leave now. Can you say what you law? Need to leave now. What regulation? You need to leave now. So you're not going to tell. Get back in your car and leave now. 
now or you will be arrested underneath this proclamation. Okay, so it's, a, so it's a proclamation. It's an emergency proclamation. Okay, thank you. Emergency proclamation. Oh, can I get your name and badge number, please? Name and badge number. Name and badge number. One, two, three, four. How many cop cars we got here? Five. Just asking what law it says I can't stop here and take pictures of Lahaina. We're on the very edge of Lahaina. We're not even anywhere over the town. This is on the very south end. As you can see, at this point, the police are not allowing anyone to even stop on the side of the highway, invoking this emergency proclamation. And after this, I noticed some of Eric's videos and live streams, mostly the ones involving some of the more contested issues, like the melted cars, roadblocks, and bizarre police behavior, had been taken down. It makes one wonder if Eric was contacted or threatened and told to remove this content. Jeff Cygnus has also stated several times in his videos that he has been contacted, threatened, and has even now left the state in order to be able to freely release videos covering the subject, going as far as warning anybody that means him harm that other people have his credentials and will continue to upload the footage if something happens to him. I cover all this in this section of the video because the authorities are clearly hiding something, something to do with the remains of the fire, some sign left behind in the wreckage, under the guise of not wanting anyone to get too close to what they are now calling Ground Zero in Lahaina because of toxic hazards hazardous waste, like paint and batteries. But what are they trying to hide? That there are little to no remains? More evidence that the fire wasn't what it seemed? I doubt we will ever really know. In any serious crime, one of the things investigators use to narrow down suspects is motive. So what would be the motive behind allowing Lahaina to burn? Well, theorists believe the motive is connected to special interests, dead set on implementing new, extremely expensive and easy to manipulate smart city technology. In January of this year, 2023, there was a smart city conference in Maui to turn Maui into an entire smart city island, pushing everything electric and making 15-minute smart cities. The theory behind why they're trying to implement smart cities being something along the lines of everything you need can be reached within your zone, and if you want to leave said zone, you'll need some kind of clearance or permission, and the only vehicles that would be allowed are limited range EV vehicles. It sounds crazy, but it's not impossible, as just a couple months ago, Hawaii governor, Pennsylvania native Josh Green, was was the keynote speaker at a UN conference in New York. We were the first state to mandate 100% renewable energy uh, for electricity. So it's again an opportunity as a small state with technically a small footprint, but we do punch above our weight a little bit because of our position in the Pacific. The island community was very skeptical about this idea, which has been kind of being pushed on them since way back in 2011. And on September 25th, there's supposed to be a Hawaii Digital Government Summit in Honolulu. The website used to detail how one of the things that would be discussed is the use of AI to regulate everything from law enforcement to electricity distribution. Now in its place lies a context note reading, misleading social media posts have been circulating falsely asserting that the Hawaii Digital Government Summit, which is held in Honolulu each year, is aimed at transforming Maui into the first smart island. These claims are incorrect and do not align with the summit's annual focus. But that's not exactly accurate. As I said, there has been a push in Maui specifically to make it a smart island. Between 2011 and 2016, Hitachi partnered with Mizuho Bank and Cyber Defense Institute, Inc., began operations on Jump Smart Maui, short for Japan US Island. Island Grid Project. The following are excerpts from Jump Smart documents. The state of Hawaii has been placing a priority on the promotion of renewable energy and EV in its energy policy in order to build a smart community in consistence with Hawaii's energy policy goals. The objective of Jump Smart Maui has been specified as below to create a mechanism to sustainably popularize renewables and EV. Direct Load Control. The program to control electric supply load from outside was implemented in phase one. The load in this context includes EV as well as electric water heaters installed in households. Also, when a sudden power supply shortage has occurred, such as a sudden drop in wind generation output, electric water heaters receive a signal and interrupt the power consumption. This is called emergency adjustment operation. In general, energy is difficult for the non-expert to understand because of the technical jargon and complicated theories. Also, the understanding for new technologies 
like renewable energy and EV, has not spread enough in Maui. Therefore, some people are still skeptical about them. So in their own documents, accounting for the details of the project, they openly state that the goal is for the entirety of Maui to be one smart community, that the intention is to be able to control and even limit power to households and electric vehicles, and that some people were skeptical, but only because the technical jargon made it too hard for them to understand. There was also a contract last year that was signed to build high-rise condos and businesses in Lahaina, which was a historical town that couldn't have any new development done to it, which is a coincidence, as one of the first government responses to the disaster was to begin meeting with developers whose interests were in figuring out how to get rid of all those pesky restrictions and speeding up the permit process so that the county can begin constructions on whatever they want. I'll also point out that the emergency proclamation basically allows for the government's disaster response to supersede any constitutional rights or previous zoning restrictions, like not being able to build in protected historical districts. Only time will tell if there's any truth to this. I guess if they build high-rises and a smart grid in Lahaina, we'll know. Just a quick word on the response from FEMA and the Red Cross. Agency Management Agency, or FEMA, had staged a fake news conference Tuesday with agency staffers posing as news reporters. See, had its own employees, you see them sitting down right there, pretend to be reporters and ask the questions. This is an excerpt of the fake news conference where the FEMA staff asked their boss, well, friendly questions. Are you, are you happy with FEMA's response so far? I'm very happy with FEMA's response so far to make sure that we understand the situation and can bring the right support to the state. This is a FEMA and a federal government that's leaning forward, not waiting to react. And you have to be pretty pleased to see that. And ask Governor Schwarzenegger what he thinks about FEMA's performance. He'll tell you the same thing, that he couldn't be more pleased how FEMA recognizes the role the federal government is facilitating that effort to the benefit of the state, the communities, and those disaster victims in California. So you have to be really proud at the, at the way our FEMA team is pulled together. Uh, so I think as a nation, people should should sit up and take notice that you have uh, the worst wildfire season in history in California. And look at how well the state and the, and the local governments are performing. Look at how well we're working together between state and federal partners. Uh, it's, a, it's a good thing to see, and it should be reassuring the American public that if a disaster does strike our country, whether it's California or a hurricane on the Gulf Coast, that we'll do the same thing. We'll pull together to support state and locals. Being questioned by, well, the country thought they were reporters, but they were FEMA staffers posing as reporters. Homeland Security Chief Michael Chertoff called the stage news briefing, quote, one of the dumbest and most inappropriate things I've seen. This day, FEMA's deputy administrator held what was called a news briefing to talk about the California wildfires. And from what we understand, the questions were posed not by reporters, but by staffers. And that distinction was not made known. Is that appropriate? It is not. Uh, it is not um, a, a practice that we would employ here at the White House. We, we certainly don't condone it. We didn't know about it beforehand. Uh, FEMA has issued an apology um, and an, saying that they had an error in judgment. It's not something I would have condoned, and um, they, I'm sure will not do it again. I, you know, I. You'll have to ask that. The organizations whose job it is to collect and disperse life-saving supplies, aid, and disaster relief to victims, time and time again, have been accused of withholding those supplies. These organizations are mostly funded by taxpayer dollars. They don't get paid per life saved. They get paid to exist. The trend with FEMA and the Red Cross seems to be a disaster occurs, they show up to justify their existence, to continue earning taxpayer dollars. They hoard supplies, which are later found in storage units, rinse, and repeat. Now, I'm sure there are great people working within these organizations, but the lion's share of disaster relief in Lahaina seems to have been organized by tireless citizens. Hi, Lenny is a daring big wave professional surfer and a Maui native, and he says he's been forced to lead a citizen-run recovery effort, one of many on the island, because the government's response, by contrast, has been inadequate. People in the fire zone telling him they haven't seen a government employee in days. Us, we were kind of sitting back waiting for help to arrive and then nothing was sort of happening. We were just in shock. But what was that tipping point for you when you realized government is not going to be able to respond the way locals can? So when I started getting texts and messages from friends on the other side saying, hey, no one is here. Do you know anyone you can call? Can you help us? We just took it upon ourselves like, OK, we could probably do a full day to hold our friends and family over before the you know caravan arrives with everything 
And it was just like day after day, where are they? I haven't seen, you know, one state, one county, one federal official at any one of the donation hubs where people are most suffering. As you can see in the clip, an exhausted pro surfer who can barely keep his eyes open speaks his truth, while the pampered well-rested reporter attests to the government's truth, which is, they're lying, we showed up, we're here. Well, being there doesn't help, helping helps. It's seemingly becoming more and more obvious as the years go by and we get closer and closer to some kind of horrifying self-inflicted societal collapse, that the lies get thinner, almost translucent. It's not up to the authorities and the media to really even try to lie anymore. It's just up to you to not look into anything. It's your job to ignore harsh truths. In danger of sounding pretentious or even speaking out of turn, I'd like to end the video by saying this. From the stories of heroics stirring the fires to the strong sense of community amongst the survivors in the following days and weeks after the disaster, it would seem as though Lahaina is not a place but a people. Their homes are gone, their belongings destroyed, their businesses and schools in ruin. It's too late to save any of that. But to further strip these people of their constitutional rights, inalienable, I might add, dispersing these great people from their own land and scattering them elsewhere, we threaten a further travesty of justice than has already occurred. This topic has been heavily censored. After 18 months on the platform, talking about everything from Bigfoot to Jeffrey Epstein, I received my first two community guidelines violations on TikTok for talking about Maui. I have no doubt the video you're currently watching will be demonetized, which is the easiest and fastest way for this platform to take a video out of the algorithm, avoiding any unsanctioned scrutiny on the topic. Citizen journalists in Maui have been censored, run out of town, threatened, and shown nothing but bravery and commitment to the people of Lahaina in response, especially Eric West and Jeff Cygnus. I urge you to look into this story on your own and come to your own conclusions. Whatever those conclusions may be, I can only hope for the people of Lahaina's sake this injustice is remembered and given the proper investigation it deserves.